Although the first part of this expedition uh, we were visiting lots of war cemeteries and battlefields, it wasn't a battlefield tour. But we felt it was important that uh, as we were passing these places that we visited them. The men in Gate made us all think uh, about the futility of war, the amount of people that had been killed and for the longer lasting effects of war for those who survived and also for us, for those that were executed by, by the, the powers that be for cowardice who were suffering from shell shock. After visiting the Menin Gate we took a wander into Ypres town centre uh, where we had uh, a meal in the square and this gave us a bit of a time to reflect on what we would just witnessed at the, the Menin Gate for some that had not, not seen that before. Uh, it was a very poignant moment for us and it gave us a time to relax after what was an absolutely hectic few days. The next morning, because we were camped up in a field, uh, we got up early and headed to Tynecott War Cemetery which is only a few kilometres outside of Ypres. The Tynecott Cemetery, the largest Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemetery in the world, it is now the resting place of more than 11,900 servicemen of the British Empire from the First World War. This area on the Western Front was the scene of the Third Battle of Ypres, also known as the Battle of Passchendaele. It was one of the major battles of the First World War. During the early stages of World War I in 1914, soldiers from the British Expeditionary Force began to report medical symptoms after combat including tinnitus, amnesia, headaches, dizziness, tremors and hypersensitivity to noise. While well, these symptoms resemble those that would be expected after a physical wound to the brain, many of those reporting sick showed no signs of headwinds. By December 1914, as many as 10% of British officers and 4% of enlisted men were suffering from nervous and mental shock. The term shell shock came into use to reflect an assumed link between the symptoms and the effects of explosions from the artillery shells. What do you think of this, George? Beautiful. Never been anywhere like this before? No. It's bang on. It's just unbelievable, isn't it? It's just the, the size of it, mate, you just can't... Can't go over Can't it. comprehend it, can you really? Uh, the lives that were lost here. And this is only, the gravestones is only part of it, the, those that they haven't recovered their bodies, you know? Whose names are on that wall? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's one of the biggest graveyards I've ever seen. Uh, memorials. It's, um, I don't know, just thousands of, thousands of people here. As an Afghan veteran yourself, uh, how does this put it in perspective? From seeing loss of life myself, to be honest with you, um, it, it, for me it hits home maybe maybe a little bit more than others. Um, you know, it's just the hardships that they would have gone through. There's nothing to war that we, you know, modern warfare doesn't go through those hardships um, in terms of everything that comes with came with World War One, but you know. Death and suffering is all the same, and uh, you know, there's all these that suffered here, but it's the, the ones that did survive. You know what they suffered with after that. Just seeing all these guys. Um, I mean, absolutely. How do you come out of that unscathed? Well, I don't think you. I don't think you do. I think there's the odd one or two that that seem to just get on with things. Well, everyone gets on with things, but I think there's the there's the people that w would have suffered, and you know. Just, Suffering a silent illness, isn't it? You know, you 
if you're not wounded, you can't see the, the injuries that are inside your head, I suppose. Yeah, and I think kind of society was tougher then. You, you couldn't have come forward. I mean, it's even hard enough today to come forward. But at that time, I just you wouldn't have never come forward and see your issues, then, would you? I think you just lived not. with them. I think I definitely think they would have. Um, you know, you look back to some of the some of the signs. You know, they were suffering shell shock when when they were in the trenches. So, you know, and it, if, if they were having problems, they didn't want to be there. It was you know, some of them were shot. So, and you think of those that were shot at dawn for cowardice. Leaving Town Cop, we set off east uh, in Belgium, uh, heading towards Mons and to the San Symphorian uh, War Cemetery, uh, a few kilometres outside Mons. As was becoming the norm so far in the expedition, uh, we had a few problems on the way towards Mons uh, when one of the vehicles went down uh, and it was an alternator problem. Uh, we got the vehicle off the main road and into a little industrial estate and then myself and another guy went off and we managed to find a small garage that uh, luckily had an alternator on the shelf that fitted one of our vehicles and it was from there back to the vehicles and uh, once again the mechanics did a sterling job and got us on the road. Now we knew from the start that building four vehicles was going to be a tough ask and this was proven to be because we were right down to the wire and building the vehicles, we didn't have a chance to test them properly. And this is why we were picking up these small problems on the way. And it wasn't going to be our last problem, we knew that. So after getting back on the road, we headed towards San Symphorian, and that was still our destination. San Symphorian, if you've never been there, is different from the other war cemeteries. It's quite small and a small village. Among those buried at San Symphorian is Private John Parr of the Middlesex Regiment. He was fatally wounded during an encounter with a German patrol two days before the Battle of Mons, thus becoming the first British soldier to be killed in action on the Western Front. It also contains the graves of Commonwealth and German soldiers who died in the final days of the conflict, including George Ellison, of the Royal Irish Lancers and George Price of the Canadian Infantry. Ellison and Price were killed on the 11th of November 1918 and are believed to be the last Commonwealth combat casualties of the war in Europe. Just outside Mons in Belgium there's Jay there, all the kits out. First time we've used all the fox wings. I think we've got a quite good setup. We are working to make it better, so this is the first time we set it up. But even as we've done uh, that, we've identified it can be much better. Table set up, all from regatta, all the regatta chairs, cook, uh, uh, well, the dinner's on, the pasta and uh, meatballs tonight. Uh, more tables from regatta here. Uh, and there's a kitchen set up. So Ant's underneath this vehicle now, just doing checks on all the nuts and bolts and making sure we've got no leaks. Pasta's always ready, meatballs. Using Coleman cookers and the cook uh, the little cook outfit we built. Fridge freezer's doing well. And that's our set up for the night. We, we finished early today, we went to see St. St. Symphorium, was it? St. Symphorium, uh, where the first and the last uh, soldier was, was uh, killed in the First World War. So there we are, set up for the night, all the beds just about done and uh, all looking good. <laughs>